What I've got today is a little squid pattern that I found in this book, Fly Patterns of Alaska, that was first published by the Alaska Fly Fishers about 40 years ago. Um, I bought a copy of the second edition from 1993, and it's a very fine book indeed. Nicely illustrated and edited, and one that I'd highly recommend. Um, and this is one of the patterns that intrigued me, the Marmot Bay Squid. And this picture is the one from the book. Uh, and it was created by Hank Pennington for Pink and Chum Salmon around Kodiak Island. And Mr. Pennington developed uh, this fly for near shore areas and incoming tides. I'm quoting here. He fishes it on a floating line with erratic strips and frequent short pauses to permit the fly to sink. Um, now, what attracted me to this fly is the very broad similarity to one of the most productive flies for sea run cutthroat in the salt water, and that's the Delia squid, which I've done a video on. The size and profile are not dissimilar, but in this case, instead of a cone head, the fly is weighted with uh, bead chain eyes on top of the shank, which means that actually it's going to swim with the hook point up. And that's a useful feature if you want to slowly present a sinking squid type fly on a typical sea run cutthroat beach uh, without getting it caught up on all the oyster shells and cobblestones and the like. And it does definitely work. Um, in fact, the first time I tied on one of these, I caught a small cutty which, which was following it in right almost to the rod tip. So anyway, this is how I tie it. Now you need a standard O'Shaughnessy Bend saltwater hook in size 4. I'm using Mustard 34007s like the original pattern, uh, which have recently been replaced by the Mustard S71 SNP DT. You could also use Daiichi 2456s. And I'm using white 6 watt thread. This is uni, but any strong white thread will do the job. And I'll start by creating a thread base which I'll run all the way um, to the bend of the hook or to the point basically where the barb would have been had I not crushed it down. Now I've picked out a nice marabou quill for my tail and I'm going to remove all the fibers that I don't need uh, so that I don't add any extra bulk to the body. You can always keep this stuff uh, for something else. That will do. And I'm going to mix in a small amount of hot pink calf tail. Uh, maybe about 15 hairs or something like that. And you want this to be really crinkly. So, uh, you know, I don't think you could use bucktail to substitute for it. Okay, that should do me. So I'm going to lay the marabou down on my desk and then distribute the calf tail around it as best as I can, top and bottom and on the sides, so it's all mixed in like that. And I want it to project about a hook length uh, behind the behind the bend. So I'm going to just attach that with, with uh, just a few quick turns to get it positioned. And then I'm just going to trim that whole clump to the length of the body. And I'll just cut away those stragglers. Then I'm going to wind my thread back towards the tail to tidy it all up and secure that marabou tightly. And it, it doesn't matter if it looks a bit untidy because uh, it's all going to be covered up. Now I'm going to tie in a, tack a hackle in front of the tail and I'm using a uh, rooster saddle. And I've got a feather here with fibers that are a bit longer than the hook gap. 
So I'll cut my feather to that point. And then I'm going to tie that in by the stem. And I can just hide that stem uh, forward along the body where it's all going to be covered up. Now I'll take about four turns uh, folding the barbs back as I go. This is a bit tricky as obviously you need to be careful of the hook point but if you take your time um, it should end up just fine. That's my four turns. Now I'll catch in the tip of the feather and just break it off. Now to deal with all those fibers that are still pointing forward I'm just going to carefully uh, take my time and fold them back. And then when I've got them all positioned, I'll just catch and win with a couple more thread turns. Now usually when you add bead chain eyes, you're going to attach them directly to the hook shank. Uh, there just isn't any way we can do that with this fly. But tying them on over all this material works just fine. In fact, it ensures that the center of mass of the eyes is going to be well above the hook shank. And that's going to help the fly to swim with the point up. So I'm putting them on right in front of the hackle. Okay, so I've used figure eight wraps to attach the eyes. And now I'm just going to add a little dab of super glue. And just let that soak into the thread to keep everything secure. Um, for the body I'm using plain white rayon chenille in the medium size. And I've got a length here. I'm just going to expose the thread core to tie it in with. I'll make sure I've got that tied in securely. All the way up and down. And then I'll advance my thread back up to the eye of the hook. I'll take one straight turn right in front of the eyes. Then wind forward in touching turns. and catch it in with my thread. And also take a few turns in front. And I can remove the waste. And then you can go ahead and make a, a small thread head and then just finish that off with a whip finish. And I'm going to add another one, just because I can. Get, get rid of my thread. And then I'm just going to coat that head with some clear Sally Hansons. And that there is the Marmot Bay Squid. Now I've got a few short pieces of video footage for you um, showing how I've been fishing the fly. 
under different conditions uh, over the last week or so. You're not going to see any monster fish, but I'm confident that this pattern's a real winner, and uh, and you should give it a try. So I very much hope that you've enjoyed the video, and if you have, please subscribe. So in this first clip, this is the incident I was talking about the very first time I tied on this, this pattern. Uh, nothing else had been working. Uh, I'm fishing a pretty shallow beach on an incoming tide, and you can see there there's a really rocky, uneven bottom. Um, and it's easy to get flies hooked up, so I'm just, um, I'm just checking that it's swimming point side up. Now I'm fishing a floating line. Uh, with a nine-foot fluorocarbon leader and uh, I'm just retrieving this in little short pulls and twitches and pauses just making it pretty erratic um, and as I was retrieving this uh, this fly I could tell there was a fish kind of snatching at it um, and following it in and you can see I actually was, uh, the leader was pretty much up to my rod tip when this little fella finally uh, took a hold of the fly. So this isn't a big fish at all, just a pretty little cutthroat. Uh, but they're all great, you know, they're all fun. Just happy to be able to catch one. So now I'm fishing a different beach, uh, still rocky, a little bit deeper. And uh, as you can tell, this is a northwest summer day, so I'm sorry for all the rain on the lens. It's, it is what it is. And you can see how I'm just doing a little double pulls and single pulls and pauses again a floating line really important and there we go that one actually took just as I paused the the retrieve And then this fish took off and decided he was going to do like a 360 all the way around. And that's a, that's a decent fish for this beach. Uh, this time uh, I'm on a, a fairly deep drop-off on a sandy beach, and um, I've seen that there are a lot of uh, a lot of uh, small coho chasing fry, and I've been fishing bait fish patterns uh, with no luck at all. So again, this is in real time. I've got my uh, my squid. I'm going to give this a try. Floating hook up, she is. Floating line. The key is these little um, erratic twitches.
this is not a big fish, just a, a little resident coho, but um, great fun to catch. And this one was doing all kinds of acrobatics and it gave up the ghost. Uh, the reason being it wrapped my leader all around its tail, so it, it couldn't it couldn't fight anymore. <laughs> 